Hello everyone, um, welcome to the Perceptive Sentinel uh, webinar. So my name is Andrzej Zupans uh, from Synergize and I'm presenting here for our research group and Perceptive Sentinel um, project, the eLearn Python package. Um, so um, I have, in the beginning, I will just briefly go um, through the main um, uh, properties of eLearn. And then in the second part of the webinar, we will also take a closer look into the code, uh, run a few examples, um, and just um, discuss if there are some open questions. Um, so let me um, just check. OK. So uh, if you want to um, speak up, um, give um, unmute your microphone. OK. So um, let's start. Um, so eLearn um, is built on top of the existing tools. So perhaps you're familiar with uh, Synergize's um, Sentinel Hub. So it's, an web, it's a web service and um, um, defines an API by which you can easily access um, satellite imagery like uh, Copernicus Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, or from uh, Landsat-8, and so on. Um, so this is very useful and convenient to get satellite imagery, but it's perhaps not useful to do, let's say, to extract or um, convenient to extract um, um, value out of satellite imagery, especially if you are used to, let's say, Python uh, data science stack. So for that purpose, we wrote a, a Sentinel Hub Py. So this is a Python library that wraps uh, Sentinel Hub API, the Sentinel Hub services, so we can make um, requests, request satellite imagery, uh, make multi-temporal requests, do cloud filtering, um, saving data to disk, loading from disk, and so on. So by this library, we can easily get the data um, in uh, NumPy uh, arrays uh, in Python. Um, but then, of course, the next step is we want to operate, we want to manipulate um, this EO data, and this is where the EOLearn then um, steps in. Um, so the EOLearn uh, library aims to uh, make value extraction from satellite imagery uh, more easily. It has three building blocks, um, EO task, EO patch, and EO workflow, which we will um, discuss um, in more details later. Um, so the eOLearn library is then just a collection of uh, Python sub-packages um, that um, and mainly aims to um, process spatial temporal data um, and by this uh, enabling users to prototype, build, and automate large-scale EO workflows. Uh, what, makes is, what makes it different from other uh, packages or other existing um, tools is perhaps that it operates on any area of interest of any size, meaning that it's not limited, let's say, to uh, Sentinel-2 tiles. So it can take um, uh, area of interest of uh, any size and you as a user um, um, have um, the ability to define this. Um, and we hope that um, you learn acts as a bridge between uh, Earth observation and Python, Python ecosystem for data science and machine learning. Um, it's open source under it's published under um, MIT license, um, so you can easily use it in any way uh, you want, and you of or of course encourage also uh, to contribute um, if you find it useful. Um, yeah, so let's um, just. Um, briefly, uh, quickly discuss what uh, it means to extract value um, from Earth observation data. So what usually this means or what a newcomer um, to this field, uh, like many of us uh, were a couple of years back. So we are giving this, uh, let's say, uh, Sentinel-2 level 1c data and want to extract some value. So we want to run an algorithm, either very simple or machine learning based algorithm that extracts something from satellite imagery. And of course, we just take the input, maybe do some feature engineering based on some literature. We train a model and we want to predict something. And then we quickly figure out that, okay, the clouds and cloud shadows are making uh, problems or making our predictions worse. So we have to do some cloud masking. So we add another layer 
um, to this pipeline, another step. And then we figure out, okay, if we want to do this multi-temporal, so uh, on a, st a temporal stack of images, um, then machine learning algorithms want to have the fixed number of features. Um, so we have to do let's, uh, interpolation or temporal resampling to, to make this unique for all uh, area of interest. So we do either linear um, interpolation, smoothing time series, and so on. Um, and this, again, complicates the entire pipeline or adds another layer. And then we figure out, okay, the level 1C data might not be of um, good enough quality, so we um, instead work on uh, level 2 uh, A data. So we add atmospheric correction um, to everything and we repeat. And then at the end, if we are still want to improve our predictions, our results, we can add um, even other sensors like um, uh, Sentinel-1. So, but the question is, I mean, um, or our approach to this, so how we uh, approach a given problem, is that, uh, of course, when you read the literature, perhaps you will see something like this that uh, at the end uh, uh, is used. But the question is why, for example, for all use cases, perhaps 80% accuracy is still acceptable, and this can be achieved with um, simpler uh, pipeline. And everybody seems to use level 2A, but this is, or was, uh, maybe a year ago, uh, uh, more expensive to acquire or uh, required more processing time. So why use level 2A if level 1C uh, is acceptable? Um, so we build an EO learn in a way so that uh, we can easily, let's say, um, uh, define pipelines, try many different experiments or try many different ways and identify what is the weakest link in the pipeline, so what drives the uh, bad precision in any given task, and improve that part and not um, uh, complicate on the things that are not necessary. And of course, during this process, we should make uh, uh, quantitative um, comparisons in, instead of uh, qualitative ones. And you learn the goal of you learn is to help you answer all of these questions. Uh, and in the same time, don't uh, in the same time um, let you to use the model of your choice. So use your domain knowledge, use um, um, simple rule-based uh, decisions if that's uh, enough. Use classical machine learning, use uh, deep learning, whatever you are comfor comfortable with or you are familiar with, um, and gets the job done in uh, let's say simple simplest manner. So the you learn doesn't want to, let's say, enforce you to use something that uh, you don't want to. So, and in the same way, so the EO Learn is not trying to replace existing pre-processing tools. Um, it just aims to build on top of that. So if you have, let's say, um, something that is called uh, analysis-ready data, so use this as an input um, to EO Learn workflow to get something valuable out of it. Okay, so now to e-learn itself, so um, to the uh, three building blocks that I mentioned before. So the first one is uh, what we call EO patch. So this is a, a common data object for uh, spatial and temporal Earth observation data and even non-Earth observation data and their derivatives. So this is uh, these are uh, mutual, uh, let's say, uh, Python objects like numpar arrays, shapely polygons, and so on. And EO patch is completely uh, sensor agnostic. So it means that um, you can use uh, any data as an input, either uh, Sentinel-2, Landsat-8, Sentinel-1, or even drone imagery, whatever. Um, and then the EO tasks, so the EO patch just holds the data, so um, represents the data. And of course, in order to extract value out of it, we need to manipulate, we need to transform data, we need to extract features, so step-by-step um, -step adding value. Uh, and this is done with EO tasks. So one EO task would be, for example, cloud detection. So take an input image and mask um, cloudy pixels. Uh, and the entire process, so from original data until the extracted value at the end, so this is what is called value uh, added 
uh, pipeline um, or value extraction pipeline. This is then packed together in the workflow. So your workflow is just a, 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 a list of tasks that uh, are performed in a special uh, order over an input EO patch. So if we take a closer look into the EO patch, um, so it's designed to store all types of EO data for single geographical um, location. And typically it's defined by the uh, bounding box in any given uh, coordinate reference system. And in principle, there is no, uh, no limit how much data uh, um, a single EO patch can store, but practically it's limited by the size of your memory. So if it's too large, then it's difficult to uh, work with it. And um, um, but in practice, for example, we um, kind of converge to an EO patch that is um, uh, thousand by thousand uh, pixels around that. So it's uh, manageable. Um, and the data. In, uh, inside the EO patch is divided into um, different categories, um, which we called feature or feature types. And this is the, the, the division is made based on the, their properties. So the feature type data, for example, so this is a raster um, and it has a time component, it has spatial component and it stores floats. Um, so it's a four dimensional NumPy array um, of, give, uh, of dimension. So the first dimension is time, then height, width, and for example, number of bands. And for example, so for each uh, time frame uh, in data, we would like to have, for example, a cloud mask. And so th since these are not uh, flows, they are integers uh, or even booleans, so we store this into a mask and so on. In some cases, like for example, digital elevation model data, um, it doesn't have any time component, so it's timeless. So we then store this into a data timeless feature and so on and so on. So um, and depending on what the structure of data is, um, it can uh, fall in, um, in one of these uh, feature types. We can also store non-EO data like reference data, so the ground truth data, uh, if it's raster, it goes then into uh, mask timeless, for example. Uh, if it's in vector format, it goes into vector or vector timeless. And uh, the last three feature types, meta info, timestamp, and bounding box, so these are uh, kind of uh, special uh, feature types that um, actually define um, the area um, which your patch represents and um, time, um, time interval um, so, uh, what are the time steps, time stamps of each uh, time frame within the EO patch? Um, okay, then EO patch is an input to an EO task, um, which, as mentioned before, per performs a single well-defined action on EO patch. So uh, this can be, for example, co-registration of frames in time series or cloud uh, masking. Um, removing um, bad frames from time um, series and so on, feature uh, calculation, feature extraction, and so on and so on. Um, so some EO tasks are implemented in EO Learn from scratch, but some can be the simple wrapper uh, around existing libraries that um, already deal with raster data within Python uh, ecosystem or executables or dockers. Um, so um, there is really no limitation of what can be used in uh, EO task. Um, EO task um, has to be uh, configurable um, or it's um, preferred if it's configurable, uh, which means um, that user um, can, um, by setting uh, this configuration parameters, can determine what uh, EO patch, uh, what EO task actually does. Um, because this we can write really general EO tasks and then by simply by changing the configuration parameter, um, the task um, behaves differently or does same thing. So works on a different uh, uh, input feature and so on. Um, and it makes uh, things more general about, generalizable and extendable. Um, and if you want to get the list of um, all 
um, your tasks, you can um, get them at the read the docs of your learn. So I will show this later as well. Um, okay. Um, so if, of course, uh, when you develop something, something new, um, it's very likely that um, your task uh, will not exist for something that you want to achieve. But um, actually, there is very or even no uh, overhead to implement one. So you just need to extend uh, your task. In the uh, in it, you define, um, let's say, um, this uh, um, uh, task specific parameters. Um, and the the only thing that then you need to do is um, implement the execute um, task, which does the magic. Um, so here is what um, your task performs or manipulates and transforms the input your patch. And this execute method also can take um, uh, patch specific um, parameters, so which are determined during the runtime uh, and not during the initialization of the task. Yeah, so here is a um, snapshot of your tasks that are currently available in your learn. Probably this is not up to date, um, but you can always get up to date a uh, list of tasks on uh, read the docs. Okay, so and then at the end, um, so uh, we combine all the tasks uh, in a graph, in an execution graph, um, or which represents the entire processing chain. Um, and so that then you simply, so you chain all the EO tasks together, and then you execute this workflow over a single patch. So, um, but this can be, so you can then loop over all your existing uh, EO patches. Uh, and in, in, in this way, you can process really large area of interests with the same um, value-added service or value-added uh, processing chain. Um, we also have this um, um, something that we call EO Executor, um, so which um, helps you to execute workflow over large number of EO patches, and it takes care of logging, uh, writing reports, and so on. So we will um, look at one of the examples later. And ideally, at the end, um, so the users should eventually interact only with your workflow. So users should only the, uh, 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 define the task, um, set their parameters, uh, um, pack the tasks together into your workflow, and execute this workflow over large area of interest. So ideally, so in future, when um, a lot of your tasks are already implemented, um, the users would not have to deal with implementation of your tasks. But if um, a certain small step of the pipeline is missing, then the user just has to uh, implement that missing part as an EO task and ideally share it with everyone else. Um, this is just um, a dummy example. Um, showing the capabilities of your workflow. Um, so how tasks can be grouped together. And so it can be any acyclic graph um, um, of tasks and dependencies. So here is just a dummy example of some uh, arithmetic calculation. So multiplication of two numbers and addition of another uh, and a constant. So um, and but for now or from our experiences, uh, most workflows that we do are basically linear. So just one uh, task, um, uh, executing one task uh, after another. Um, yeah, so and um, as I mentioned before, the EO patch or EO learn um, is um, sensor agnostic. So for example, um, here is just a uh, slide summarizing or showing how um, it would be possible to run um, something, some value ex, uh, uh, extraction pipeline over uh, different sensors. So using Sentinel-2, uh, Landsat-8, and Sentinel-1. So for each uh, um, sensor, of course, there are some uh, the, the, the workflow or pre-processing um, would be different. 
So like cloud masking, it, it doesn't um, the all the algorithms don't work on Sentinel two and Landsat eight. So you, you would have to do this separately for both uh, sensors. But so you prepare the data um, in a common format. Um, and then at the end, you would merge everything together in the single EO patch, and you could run then um, interpolation, resampling, or um, some uh, machine learning to extract um, some value on top of it. Um, yeah, just to um, so this was very quick and uh, high level overview. Uh, of uh, how EOLearn is constructed. But um, let's take a look um, on some realistic use case or a realistic example, which is land use land cover classification, uh, which is done in EOLearn. Um, so this is um, 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 available on our GitHub repository. So you can um, get the uh, notebook um, uh, where you can run this also by yourself. Um, and here we will just quickly take a look over, um, so just an overview of what is done. So the processing pipeline in the nutshell. So we first, of course, start with uh, um, defining what kind of input we will use. So in our example, we use uh, time series, one year long time series of Sentinel-2 level 1C data. So, and this is our area of interest of um, Slovenia. Um, so we um, um, define what the input bands are. Um, so, and we can, for example, plot, uh, make a RGB image or true color image uh, to see if everything works correctly. Then, of course, we need to perform cloud masking and filtering. So we uh, run, uh, we add uh, another task to the pipeline and we use S2 Cloudless to do that. We can then also calculate from the raw bands that we requested in the beginning. We can uh, calculate additional features like uh, normalized difference uh, vegetation index or water index. Uh, we can then, of course, if we want to um, train, uh, make a, a supervised training of, uh, of a classifier, we need the ground truth data. And we can um, take a vector data um, okay, um, there's a question. I will um, come to it uh, in a minute. Um, um, we can add ground truth data. So uh, in this particular case, uh, it was uh, in a vector format. So we rasterize it. Um, then in order to, uh, since um, in this case, machine learning um, algorithm requires a fixed number of uh, input features, we have to temporarily resample to fix grid of dates. Uh, we also then uh, spatially sample pixels to create training and validation uh, data sets. Uh, we train a model, and this can be any model of your uh, liking, so whatever you are uh, familiar with or um, believe it will give you the best results. So you can use any model library outside EOLearn, and once you train a model, you include it. Um, so you, if you use something special, you write a task, um, that wraps it and then include the model uh, in the workflow. And then you can have a complete EOLearn workflow from the start to the beginning uh, where it makes uh, predictions. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's see the question. Uh -huh. um, the question is how the discontinuities between patches, uh, how are these discontinuities uh, managed to guarantee a seamless uh, processing? Um, in this example um, and in this notebook, it is not shown um, yet. So um, this uh, feature was not available at that point. But at the, uh, now, uh, in the latest versions, we can have um, patches um, that overlap. So we um, each EO patch is, uh, in this case, is uh, a little bit um, enlarged. Um, and overlaps with the neighboring patches, um, meaning so that then you can, um, you, and the user defines what is the overlap, uh, uh, how large is this overlapping area. So you can then, you process each individually patch, um, uh, you process each patch individually, but then at the end when you combine predictions or uh, from the machine learning model um, in the 
this overlap area, you can make uh, a seamless transition. Uh, I hope that this um, answers your question. Um, yeah. And uh, what is important uh, in this step is that uh, while you are doing this, um, it's important that uh, you also learn or that we learn. Uh, whenever we have a, a, a new problem and we start with something, we learn in the process. And for example, um, this is uh, um, just shows that um, by doing this on a large scale, we figured out or I mean um, that our uh, cloud detection algorithm um, um, uh, introduces some problems in areas which are um, either very dry or bright, like this riverbed um, in this uh, image shown here. So below you can see um, with the red um, um, cloud detections uh, with S2 cloudless. Um, so, and as you can see in most uh, images selected here, there are no clouds. So these are all false detections of very bright area or this uh, ri uh, dry riverbed as clouds. And this made us then uh, work on multi-temporal cloud detection uh, which can avoid this problem. But so the, the, the point being here is um, that, yeah, when you do it uh, this iteratively, you add um, different tasks um, to the workflow. You check what are the results that uh, the point is that you learn so that you also learn and see what is important and um, uh, how to progress further um, towards your goal. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, um, this uh, example is uh, uh, is available as a notebook on our GitHub repository, and uh, you are, of course, encouraged to check it and run it, and it actually even works on your laptop. So uh, that's a very important um, part as well. Um, yeah, so a um, few uh, resources. So I mentioned the read the docs where you can also find all the list of existing EO tasks, um, documentation of EO task, EO patch, and so on. Um, we have written a few blog posts on EO Learn and use cases using EO Learn, um, which are available on our Medium blog. So you, you are also um, welcome to check that. And um, of course, all the code is um, um, available on our GitHub repository. Um, so the EOLearn library, Sentinel Hub Pi, and also the um, uh, webinar material, which I will show you later. And all this, of course, is um, developed within the Perceptive Sentinel project. Um, OK, so now it's um, time for more uh, hands-on uh, part. Um, so I will go to this um, um, GitHub repository. Um, so I'm here now. And I will launch um, um, the binder. Um, um, so um, I will uh, all the uh, examples uh, which I will uh, which I will show now. Um, you can um, run on binder in the same way as I do uh, now. So you don't need to install everything, um, anything on your um, computer. But of course, um, if you want to do something more serious, you are encouraged. And you can install it on your laptop, on your cluster, or DS, or a cloud provider like AWS or uh, any, a, anyone else. And so you are on control. So you are on, uh, in control of resources that you want to use um, to do something. So you, you don't need to rely on any um, let's say, platform or the resources um, that that platform provides for you or um, costs that are related to it. Um, OK. OK, so the um, this binder instance has started. So um, in the notebooks repository, there are many different uh, examples. We will start with the uh, introduction. So which gives an uh, overview of uh, um, everything that is available um, uh, for you to test. And as a first step, you need to, uh, since we will use Sentinel Hub uh, as a data gateway to get the input uh, satellite 
uh, imagery, we need to provide an instance ID. Um, so if you have one, uh, you um, set it here like this. And if you don't have one, just go and make a, um, a free account um, and you will get one. So I created one um, for this purpose and I will set it here. Okay, so this is the, then the instance ID that is set and this will be valid during this webinar and then um, invalid later on. Um, okay, so we will start with the uh, EO patch. Um, take a look into a few things. Um, yeah, so here the uh, in the beginning, the uh, notebook just um, summarizes what was explained by me before. And um, the, we will start by um, loading one EO patch that was that is stored on disk. So we will um, read an EO patch from um, disk and load it to the memory. And so the last line here, actually um, prints out what is inside an EO patch and we can take a look. So you can see that you can store many different uh, features, but um, it's not necessarily that uh, all of them are populated. And let's see what is um, um, available in this example EO patch. So under data feature um, here, we have an array which is called bands S2 level 1C. So this is quite uh, self-explanatory, uh, I hope. Um, what it means, so it has uh, 13 level 1C Sentinel-2 bands. We have also cloud probability and NDVI. So we calculated NDVI from the uh, input bands. We have also cloud masks in mask um, also um, a mass that we call it is data um, because not all rasters, not all time frames um, can have valid data uh, and so on and so on. So, um, but maybe one thing to note is that when you load it, you can use lazy loading true. And so you just read the, um, um, you just read the metadata about the patch, So you know what kind of, um, uh, features are inside, but you actually don't load them into the memory. So only when you need them, um, it's loaded into the memory. This is important because sometimes you just need to, for example, um, read something from the EO patch that is very small, so a smaller array like, um, let's say, um, label, um, and not data, which is usually huge um, and takes more time and memory. Um, yeah, but now, for example, if when we um, um, access the data feature, um, so the individual bands and check the shape, now the bands will be loaded into the memory. Um, so this is also quite f fast and the shape is um, 68, 101 times 100 times 13. So if you remember, if we, if we check in the table above, this is time, times height, times width, times a number of bands. So we have 68 time frames um, of um, Sentinel-2 imagery um, of size 101 times 100 and for all 13 bands. And in this particular case, um, um, also the cloud mask was vectorized and the vector vectors were stored um, in the uh, feature um, type vector. And so for each timestamp, we have also the cloud mask. Um, as I mentioned before, the bounding box defines what area uh, um, this EO patch covers and the timestamp gives um, the time interval and the individual timestamps um, from which the time frames are taken. So this is from 2015 July 11 to 22nd um, December in 2017, and it has 68 timestamps. Okay. Um, so now, for example, we can create a new EO patch. So this will be an empty EO patch, and we can add uh, or store um, new features inside. So, for example, we can just copy from the existing EO patch. Uh, into a new one 
and create a new, let's say, um, masks uh, which just uh, with um, zeros and so on. Um, we can also delete features. So from the new EO patch, we can delete the bands. So um, and we can also store it uh, uh, to the disk. So save it um, for later use. So uh, 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 so this basic functionality. So input, output, renaming features, uh, adding new features, removing features. So this is all supported um, also by and tasks okay so what is then perhaps interesting is uh, okay perhaps let's um, um, plot so let's make an rgb image so this is a cloudy scene um, and if we ch change the timestamp let's say we get something else um, so this is quite small EO patch, so it's not um, very well visible what it represents, but it looks like something like forest and road and perhaps uh, patches of grassland. Okay. And as I mentioned before, so you can also add new features with uh, um, um, tasks. So for example, here is an implementation um, uh, showing how with the task you can add a new feature. So you just um, in init you would define what the uh, feature name would be, um, and then in execute would the, you would actually provide um, the feature that you want to store. Um, okay, there is another question. Oh, sorry, um, there was another question, but I by mistake I deleted it. I'm very sorry about that. Um, could you repeat it? Um, okay, um, yeah, and so here we define this task. We say, okay, we will add a feature type data with name new bands into it. And this data, we just made up uh, an array. And when we execute um, the task, we add the data. And so if we start with an empty EO patch, then the resulting EO patch will have a new bands data array. Okay, and yeah, so when you then want to do more complex things, of course you uh, want to combine um, different um, tasks into um, uh, EO workflow. Okay, before going there, let's check now the uh, question. Uh -huh. uh, so the question is whether the input for the EO patch must come from Sentinel Hub or we can use any so other catalog. Um, the so um, the in EO Learn currently there are tasks that use Sentinel Hub services to get uh, Earth observation data. There is also a possibility to read directly from um, 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 from um, Sentinel two tiles on disk. So if you have um, Sentinel-2 tiles, um, you can uh, read them with EO Learn and create EO patches out of them. So this is then completely avoiding uh, Sentinel Hub. And for the hackathon, um, which will take place in November, we aim to implement also an EO task that will use Open EO, Open EO API to access satellite imagery and open EO pro, um, has or wraps uh, many different backends. So Sentinel Hub, uh, Google Earth Engine and others. And so with open EO, you could with this task and open EO, you could also get then um, um, data from other sources. Yeah, so and if you have something completely different in mind, then um, um, it's just a matter of um, writing a task that knows how to fetch the data from a given source. And then it's just a matter of storing it inside an EO patch as NumPy array. And that's it. So it's um, not limited to Sentinel Hub in any way. Okay. Um, okay, moving on. So your workflow. So in this, this is just um, a simple workflow in which 
we execute three tasks, um, so defined here. We will load your patch from disk. We will add a new feature to it, and we will store the resulting your patch to disk. So, and this is we uh, uh, executed, so we defined it. So here is the definition of the workflow. We specify what is the input task, and then we add another uh, add feature task, which has as a dependency the results of the previous task and so on. And we then execute it, and in the execute of the workflow, we have to specify this runtime specific uh, parameters. And this is what is the location of the EO patch. Um, we also add this new feature and where we um, store the EO patch. And we can also visualize this. Um, so the dependency graph of the workflow. So this is a linear. Um, uh, workflow and so this is very useful also for debugging um, so to check whether uh, the definition of the um, workflow uh, is done correctly and in many cases the workflows are linear so then we also made this um, possibility to define very easily the linear workflows which is slow task add feature and save and that's it so it's much easier um, for the user to define this as mentioned um, you can do this um, um, then when you run over s multiple EO patches, uh, so not over, over on, only over a single one, but uh, a large number of EO patches uh, over large area of interest, then we use EO executor. Um, and in this example, um, it, we will run it over five patches in three parallel processes. And the benefit of this executor, oh, I executed it again. The benefit is that it makes a report. So we will make a report, which is now saved to this location. So we go and check it. Uh, outputs, OK. I executed twice, so here is it. So we click report HTML. And this is the report. So the report says what kind of um, workflow we executed. It was executed five times, and all executions were successful. Um, it also um, um, lists what EO tasks and what kind of parameters we use them. And for each execution, so for five execution, it also um, summarizes how um, long it took and also gives a log so you can check um, um, what happened during the execution of the workflow. So this is also quite useful for debugging and so on. OK. Um, OK. Um, going on, yeah, okay. So this is uh, we went over the basics um, of um, this in the uh, tutorial, um, and now there are many more examples. So how to um, run over large area of interest, for example, here, uh, um, how to add information from OpenStreetMap, how to use Sentinel One data, um, um, how to visualize. Um, things and but for the also there is this land cover example which I mentioned before and show you before but um, I will like to conclude with this uh, water surface level extraction um, as an example um, so um, so here let me just show you so here the idea is that let's build a workflow or value extract Think pipeline that will for a given uh, water body for a given reservoir given lake calculate what is the current surface water level so what is the surface area of water compared to what is the nominal size or nominal area of the reservoir um, and this is then ended up as a blue dot uh, water observatory project that we did um, and here we um, is, we can show you how this can be done inside EOLearn. So to begin, we just need uh, uh, outline, so uh, a polygon defining the borders of the uh, uh, water body, and we just use um, the ones that is used in this water observatory. Um, so we just download it and we plot it. So here you see, so this is a, a shapely geometry a polygon that just defines the borders of this uh, Thie Waters Kloof Dam in South Africa. And we define 
uh, we create a bounding box. So we define now a bounding box. And this is this bounding box um, shown in blue is now a definition of an EO patch. So we will use this bounding box to create an EO patch. Um, before we do that, we um, have to create a workflow um, that will extract uh, water. And this is done in several different steps. So unfortunately, we don't have um, all the time um, to go through all the details. Um, but um, maybe let's see. Um, maybe, maybe we can go. So the core of this is water detection task. And this, so um, it's defined here. And what the water detection task does is it takes the NDWI, runs Kenny edge detection um, 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 to, to, to get a, a border of water. And then it runs also threshold, uh, threshold um, uh, method to determine the, what is the best threshold to separate water um, from non-water um, using NDWI, um, creates a water mask and vectorizes it. So that's uh, uh, basically the procedure. Uh, and of course, in order to get um, um, good results, we need to do also cloud maskings and all the usual stuff. So, and these are then the rest of the um, tasks. So basically the workflow is we um, get, we fetch the data. Um, so using uh, Sentinel Hub. So we, although it's not needed, we also fetch the true color RGB image just for the um, visualization. We also fetch NDWI. We run the uh, cloud detection algorithm on it in order to um, do cloud masking. Um, we rasterize, um, um, we rasterize also the um, um, the nominal um, uh, water body extent, and we at the end run the water detection task. So we define all the tasks, we combine them into a linear workflow. So also visualized here, right? So it's in the same order, and we executed and we will do this for um, so the time interval is now between 2017 January 1st until January 1st 2019 so for two years um, we will get all available imagery um, Sentinel-2 imagery um, in our area of interest so this is this bounding box around the Tehe Waters Kluv Dam and for each image in this temporal stack, we will do water extraction. And we will store the results inside an EO patch. And so this takes uh, a while. So um, before the um, before I started, I checked it and it took uh, one minute. So um, now it's executing. So remember, now all the data is being fetched. So it's downloaded um, using Sentinel Hub services on the machine where this Jupyter notebook is running and um, all the processes are then done. So, okay, also this time, the execution time for this process was around eight minutes. So let's see what is now inside an EO patch. Um, we have cloud probabilities, we have NDWI and we have true color image for all 97 timestamps in this time period. So there are 97 uh, time frames in this time period. We have cloud masks, validator masks. Um, for each time frame, we calculate the cloud coverage. And this is the most in interesting part, this um, the extracted water level. So this is a surface water level um, ratio between um, detected water area and nominal water area. We also store the detected water outline um, so for uh, display purposes, and we also have a mask of uh, nominal water. And that's basically it. And what is now we have to do is just visualize things. 
So, for example, this uh, um, first visualization is visualization of NDWI. So this is used as an input um, to water detection um, task. So the water detected is um, based solely on this uh, input. Um, we can also plot now the RGBs with detected uh, waters, water outlines uh, here. Um, to, 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 to see and to cross-check if our uh, water detection algorithm works correctly. Um, and the visual inspection says, okay, it's, the results are uh, quite good. So I think we can be happy with this. And um, now the last thing is, of course, we want to um, visualize um, how the water detection um, changes uh, or how, sorry, how water levels change over time in this two-year period. And this is shown with this blue line. So, and the dots are the measured, uh, uh, measured uh, surface water levels. As you can see, this is quite um, spiky. So we have um, sudden drops or um, sudden spikes. And this is, can be identified to um, um, to time frames with uh, cloud cover. So we didn't um, explicitly exclude uh, frames with uh, too much uh, cloud, uh, cloud cover. So for example, here you can still see there are time, um, um, time frames with cloud cover. And if clouds cover area with water, then we will measure, uh, we will detect less of it. And if we have a cloud shadow, then cloud shadow can be detected as water um, by mistake. So we can measure more than what it usually is. So this explains the drops and the spikes. But we also stored the what is the fraction of pixels in each frame covered with clouds. And we can filter on that number. So if we just keep time frames with cloud cover um, around 2% or less than 2%, then this is what we get. So, and as you can see, now it's a smooth function. Um, so, and this is more close to um, uh, correct values. So now we have a smooth transition or smooth um, 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 measure of um, the surface uh, water levels detected with this. Um, yeah, so now, now that we have, so what the next step here would be, now that we have um, um, this working workflow of uh, water detection, uh, we can, of course, um, run it not only on a single uh, water body, but we can run it on, let's say, on all water bodies in South Africa or all water bodies in um, Africa or all water bodies or many water bodies um, over uh, entire globe uh, and using the exactly the same workflow. So everything that is defined in here, so all the tasks defined here, including this water detection task, now we just simply have to replace um, the input and run the same workflow over another uh, um, water body outline and we will get results for everything and this is what we did and this is um, um, this is then um, what is shown here so you can see for example so here in South Africa we were doing this water body I oh, know this one right um, and you can check another one here. So for example, a neighboring one, and you can see how the water levels changed. And this is done with exactly same code and it's done over 13,000 water bodies. So this um, hopefully um, shows the benefit uh, of using this approach.